Good morning and welcome to Church of the Rock. We're so glad you're here with us today. If you're new today, I just want to let you know what you can expect from our service. It's about an hour long from now, from now until the end. We're going to have some more worship, hear from our pastors, the message from the Lord, and then we'll end with some more worship in a time of prayer. Again, welcome to Church of the Rock. If you're new here, we would like to get to know you better. So please fill out the welcome card located in the back of the pew, place it in the offering plate, and after the service, come out to the lobby to our welcome center where we have a gift for you. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas around our sanctuary and we're all in the Christmas spirit. Why don't you start your holiday Christmas Eve day out by showing your family and everyone you love the most important thing about Christmas is Jesus. We have a one hour service on December 24th at 9 a.m. One hour. And then go home, do all your festivities and get ready for the rest of the, uh, the day in the, in the event and come back at seven o'clock for the Christmas Eve pageant. You don't want to miss that. Let's remember why we celebrate Christmas because Jesus is the reason for the season. Coming up at Church of the Rock, a group of young families are putting on a Christmas extravaganza where young children will be able to decorate their own gingerbread houses, sip on some hot cocoa, and play some games with their friends. Your kids are not going to want to miss out on this Christmas extravaganza, so sign up in the lobby. Space is limited. Hope to see you there. A couple of announcements. One thing is in your bulletin, the poinsettia order form. We'd like to have the sanctuary filled with poinsettias in honor and memory of your loved ones. Fill out the paper, bring it, send it in the plate, and we'll be sure to have a list of your loved ones that'll be recognized on Christmas Eve and through the Christmas season. And then ladies, you do not want to miss the Ladies Christmas Home Tour, December 9th, six o'clock. Tickets are on sale in the lobby. They're $10 a piece. It's a perfect time to bring your girlfriends, your next door neighbors, your aunts, your nieces, your brothers, no, no brothers, sisters to the event. Tickets are on sale. It's the last Sunday you can get them. So come get your tickets. Are you ready kids? Get up on your feet and head on back to Kids Church. Best place ever. Did you know that every morning, a little bit of heaven comes to earth? It comes in the form of sunlight, light that began its journey 93 million miles away from us. It's light that traveled for a grand total of 8 minutes and 20 seconds to get from the sun to your front window or to your face when you walk out the door uh, on your way to work or out the... Uh, let put the dog out for that first little outing. Whatever the case might be, when you first encounter that sunshine, a, a little bit of heaven has come to earth. It, and of course, without the sun, our planet would just be an icy ball of rock with nothing even remotely alive on it. But because of that touch of that light coming from the sky, coming from, from heaven into our physical world, all that we experience is possible. We are able to live, we're able to grow things, we're able to see, we're able to be warm, uh, or even too warm, as the case might be. Um, but that little touch of heaven brings physical life to this planet. And on a dark night in Bethlehem, angels lit up the sky with the announcement that another sun was rising. This one bringing a brand new day that was about to dawn. In Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 11, the angel said these words, to you, this is to the shepherds, to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those he favors. You see, that very night, heaven's king came to earth, not to visit, but to stay, heaven on earth. And when that baby grew up, he taught us to pray, as we read in Matthew 6, verse 9, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven on earth. Or as sometimes it's put, heaven and earth overlapping. It's always been God's plan. Go to the very first story in the Bible where you find Adam and Eve in the garden. And you read that God was present every evening walking with them. It was always his plan that heaven would come to earth. The baby in the manger. It's a beautiful picture of God himself being born in human flesh. Heaven coming to earth. And if you go all the way to the end of the story, all the way to the book of Revelation, you find when you get there that the way the story, the earthly story that we know ends, and the new story that hasn't been written yet for us begins, is by heaven coming down and resting on earth. God living with us here. But the challenge is for us to actually live out that reality. How can we see God in such a dark and confused world? Uh, probably there are mornings when you wake up and the last thing that you think is, this is heaven on earth. I mean, we probably have a few of those good moments. You know, you're on vacation, you're in a beautiful place. And you know, I was watching a movie last night, a ski movie, and, and literally the, the, they had some scene with snow umpteen feet deep and the skier just looked up and said, it's heaven on earth. I thought, yeah, I'm preaching on that tomorrow. <laughs> but a lot of times our world isn't like that. A lot of times our world feels like the opposite. It may feel like a hell on earth. Uh, it may be that we're afflicted by some physical problem, or it may be that relationships have gone sour. Or it may be that we're just filled with fear about, uh, about our future, about how life is going to go. Uh, our world is in a, a darker place, it would seem, in some ways with um, the fears about places like North Korea and terrorism and so on. And so easy for us to just see the dark instead of seeing the light. How do we come to see that the baby that was born in Bethlehem changed everything forever, that Jesus is here, that we are living in a place where heaven is already present on earth? Well, John in his gospel, found a way to answer that question. And we see this answer in the very opening verses of his gospel, words that you heard read to you this morning as we uh, lit the first Advent candle. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What came into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Now, John's description of heaven coming to earth focuses on someone he refers to simply as the Word. He's talking about a person, a person we know to be Jesus, the Son of God. But he starts the conversation here not by talking about Jesus by name, but rather by referring to him as the Word. In the original text, John's term for the Word was a Greek word, the Greek word logos, L-O-G-O-S. It's a word that John chose very, very carefully. Uh, you and I use a derivative of that word all the time. Uh, when you talk about psychology, the L-O-G-Y comes from this word logos. It means the study of the, the soul or the mind. We talk about biology, zoology, even theology, the study of God. All the thoughts that come together around that. When we even talk about logic, we're using this word logos. So it was a word that had a rich supply of meaning. First of all, it simply meant a spoken word, a word, a meaningful statement. And for Jewish readers of John's gospel, who were a major part of his audience, for Jewish readers, saying these words, in the beginning was the word, meant a retelling of the Genesis creation story. When they heard the words, in the beginning, they immediately knew, oh, well, that's how Genesis began. In fact, in the Hebrew Bible, the name of the book of Genesis is not Genesis, it is, quote, in the beginning. Because every book in the Torah is, it begins with the first words of that book. So when they heard, in the beginning was the word, they 
naturally would have thought, ah, we're doing the creation story. And God created by his spoken word. Let there be light. And there was light. Now for Greek readers, we're talking about people coming from a very different point of view. Now, they didn't grow up with the Hebrew Bible, and they didn't grow up in that part of the ancient Near East. Uh, they were a little bit more like we are as Westerners, many of us, uh, thinking of the world in, in a different way. For the Greeks, the universe had a, the name cosmos, the cosmos. And it was thought of as an ordered place, a place that had been built according to a plan. What be, lay behind this ordered world was reason, or, to use their word, logos. So you think about what happens when you build a house. You don't just call up you know, sticks and stuff, and they drive up with a pile of boards and plywood and screws and shingles and so on and drop it off. You, first of all, have to design a blueprint and a good contractor will know how many boards he needs, how many two by sixes, and how long, and how many sheets of plywood, and how many squares of shingles, and so on. What you build is based upon the logos of what you're building, the, reason, the, the plan, the purpose, the reason behind this thing that happens. So when the Greek readers heard John say, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. They understood that to be God had a plan. God built a world according to his own logos. Now, in Jewish thought, by the time John was writing, these two ideas had already begun to come together in an interesting way. So you have the Jewish idea of a spoken word, God commanding the universe into existence. And this Greek idea of God having a plan when he commanded the world into existence. For the Jewish people, the word became, that, that spoken word became thought of as God's wisdom. You see, a word with a plan. And, we, and they thought of, in the book of Proverbs, God creating the world through his wisdom as if this wisdom were his master craftsman making it all happen. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, read like this. This is wisdom speaking. Wisdom says, when he, God, marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker. I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always. So here, in this one little word, logos, we have a term that the Jew and the Greek could relate to. It went back, takes them back before the creation of the world, it gave them each a familiar starting point for the world story. They kind of understood from their own point of view what we're talking about here. It also opened up the door for understanding how God could create through his mind, his plan, his thoughts, his wisdom. And that wisdom was always there with him in the beginning. But this story also, as John will make clear to us, opened the door for something they never expected. God coming into our world as a fellow human being to dispel the darkness and sin and death. Now John begins the word's journey from heaven right up there in that place where the word was with God, the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. You see, if the word is God's wisdom, then that means that the word is part of God himself. Think about what happens when you think about something. So you think about something you want to do, like go on a missions trip next, next uh, October. Well, where does that start? Well, it starts in here and it starts in here. It's a part of you that you are going to eventually act out and make happen. Now, it's not something that just floats over your head. It's not something that you get in a pill and you pop it in your mouth and you have a thought. It's part of you. And so when John says, in the beginning was the word, with God and was God, he's saying there never was a time when the Almighty God, the Father, was not filled with this wisdom and this word that is his thoughts toward you and me. There was never a time when the word wasn't. See how he says, in the beginning was the word. 
He doesn't say in the beginning the word was created or the word was thought up or the word was this or the word was that. He says, oh no, the word has been there as long as God has been there. Jesus put it this way in the book of Revelation. The word now speaking to us through John again in chapter 1, verse 17. He says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. In the beginning was the word. That's another way of saying, I am God's own name. And there we start this journey of the word. But then John goes on to say that it's this word, this part of God, who, that actually made the world. Remember that idea from Proverbs about wisdom being God's master, master craftsman? Well, now John has kind of shifted that. And he said, well, let's think of that wisdom as logos. That's a term that we can all kind of relate to here. God's powerful word spoke the universe into being, and behind that powerful word was God's perfect plan and purpose. The world comes into being. But then comes that unexpected twist. Verses 3b, the end of verse 3 and verse 4. John 1, verses 3b and 4. Then he says this, What has come into being in him, the word, was life, and the life was the light of all people. Now he's not just talking about God's mind and God's thoughts and God's word speaking creation. He's not just talking about the word as God's master craftsman. He's talking about the word, this person now, coming to life in our world. That which was in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. That which came into being, something happened to the Word. The Word started having an earthly experience that could be marked off in time, just like we live in time. You have a birthday. Jesus had a birthday. All of a sudden now, John says, this idea that you're familiar with has taken an unfamiliar and amazing journey right into the heart of our world. The great word of God, present at creation as spoken word, and the deep logic of reality came to life in our world. As John's going to show us, the word became flesh, a verse that we'll be coming to in a few weeks. The creator became the created. Only then we could experience heaven on earth. Remember, the goal that God had all along was that you and I would experience heaven on earth. Now, scientists tell us that when we look at the sun, we only see 44% of its light. I think I got a little picture up here. There, look at this chart here. You all see the rainbow there. That represents the light of the sun that your eyes can see. And it makes a beautiful world for us. We see a rainbow. We are seeing all of that light broken out by the way it's, it's refracted in the clouds. But this is what we see. This is what makes our world work for us. Now, over on the left is what's called ultraviolet light. That's what you can't see, but you get a sunburn from. That's what you put on your SPF 54. Do you guys use a lot of that down there? Yeah, I hope, right? Because you don't see it, but it sees you. And on the other side is Marty's friend, heat. <laughs> All of that other part, 49% of the, what you experience of the sun, it comes in the form of heat and then ultimately other types of radiation that we don't see or feel. My point being this, when you see the sun, you only see part of it. You don't see all of its radiation. You don't see all of its light. You see what your eyes are capable of seeing. So do we see the sun? Well, duh. Yeah, of course we see the sun. But do we really see the sun? Well, we'd have to say, well, we only see the part that we can experience. And the same thing is true with the great God who made us, who created us, and made himself known to us. How are we going to see God? How are we going to see heaven on earth? How are we going to see God step into our real life situations? How are we going to see God step into that marriage that isn't working? How are we going to see God step into the life of that child who's making wrong decisions? What about those dark places in our community where, where uh, people are getting hung up in 
uh, addictions that are just destroying their life plan and making horrible situations for their children and for their families. How do we get light there? And the answer is that when the Word came into our world, He came in the visible light that we could relate to. This time, not as a ray of sunshine coming from, from 93 million miles away, but coming as a human being, coming as a person. That's what Christmas is all about. All of God that you can possibly ever see or experience in the only form that you could ever experience Him, and that is as another person. You see, if God came as a tree, like a giant sequoia, Oh, it'd be wonderful. We would all build a wall around the tree and we would, might all come and bow down to the tree. But we can't really relate to the tree because we aren't trees. We would just see, it's big, it's old, it's beautiful. But it's not really getting into side of what we are. And we could say, well, I just worship the, the God of the cosmos. And you have some fuzzy idea of some being who created all things. Well, that's fine as far as it goes, but... It doesn't really help you with going through your daily life, with facing the things that are happening in your life. When God comes as a person, here's a person who loves you and you can experience that love. Here's a person who forgives you and you can experience that release from shame and guilt. Here's a person who walks with you as Rob Made it, Pastor Rob made it so clear last, last week. When you're at the bottom of the well, when you're in that place where nobody else wants to be with you, and Jesus is right there beside you, and he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. It takes a person to say something like that. I don't care how smart they make the computers. Listen, having your little Alexa say to you, I will never leave you. I will never <laughs> forsake you. is not going to make you feel better that day. <laughs> Seriously, it's sweet, but there's nothing behind it. But when the great God of heaven breaks into your dark place and Jesus makes himself known, however he chooses to do that, whether it's in your own prayer and in just a, or in your own inner relationship with him, or whether it's through the calling and touch of a friend who comes and brings encouragement, or what, how, whatever it is, however God wraps his arms around you, he changes you because his light comes in, and it can only come if it comes in a relationship, person to person. The word had to become flesh. Every morning, the sun comes up, whether we see it in all of its glory here in Vermont or not. Nonetheless, it comes up, and the darkness has to go. No matter how dark the night's been, it's no match for those first rays of dawn. And the same is true for the Word, who is the light of all people, when Jesus comes into our world. John finishes this first little part of his, of his uh, prologue by saying in verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Think about it. Jesus' birth was not announced at high noon in the center of Jerusalem. It was proclaimed by angels in the dead of night to a group of terrified shepherds who stumbled their way through the dark fields to find a little stable with a manger. The word who is the light came into a dark world. No emperor trembled in his bed that night. King Herod had no clue that the true king of the Jews was lying in a manger six miles away from his palace in Jerusalem. But the first streaks of dawn were already present in the eastern sky. The light was shining already in the darkness, and the darkness could do nothing to overcome it. Heaven on earth. What do you think those shepherds experienced when they walked in to that little stable area and they saw Mary and Joseph, and they saw that baby, and they realized everything the angel said was true. They experienced heaven on earth. What do you think they told when they said, you won't believe what we saw out in the field? The angels came, and they said this, and they said that. They told us what would be here, and they sang glory to God in the highest, and peace on those on whom God's favor rests. And we're feeling that peace because his favor is resting on us, heaven on earth. Every morning, Jesus promises to do the same thing for you. To make the darkness flee. Now, every one of us has places in our lives 
where the darkness is going to seem more powerful than his light. It may be just something that's happening physically uh, to you or a loved one. And it can create that sense that, that we're in a dark place. That we're not, uh, we need to move up a couple slides, I think. Yeah, there we go. We, we may, um, thank you, Francis. We may be in that place where we just don't see how the situation can be, can be enlightened. It just seems too late. It seems like we're at the other end of the day, you know, as the light is fading instead of the lights are coming on. It may be that you just feel like giving up on a relationship. It may feel like you just feel there's no hope for a person that you care about or a loved one or for a, a, a problem in our community. But let me promise you, Jesus is here just like he was here when those angels sang and when those shepherds came into that, into that, uh, that little stable. And he is here to make the darkness flee. When he comes, the darkness has to go. It has to go. And he invites us to turn toward him and welcome God's presence into our lives every single day. Listen to what John wrote to some Christians uh, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. And here he's going to tell the story again. He says that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Remember what we just read? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Well, now John puts it this way. God is light, and there is no, in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we're walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Did you ever pull out of a parking lot uh, in maybe around twilight or a little darker, and forget to turn on your headlights. Anybody else? Am I the only one in here? Oh, come on. Yeah. I guess I've been driving too long. A bunch of us have. And I've driven down the road, and all of a sudden, everybody's so friendly. Lights are flashing at me. And I remember thinking, oh, there must be a policeman around here somewhere. I'm looking around, and I'm driving along, you know, and bling, 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 blinking the lights, and they're turning them on, turning them off, and I'm riding going, yeah, what are they doing? All of a sudden, it's like, Hey, my lights aren't on. Click, turn the lights on. Same thing happens for us spiritually. We can start our day and forget to turn on our lights. We can start our day and we can just still be those people of the night. Still making the assumptions of the dark, the assumptions of the night. Not hoping, thinking, expecting that God's going to do anything new in this day. You see what John says? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the way of putting that is let him be our headlights, then we have fellowship with him. We're in that relationship we're meant to have. Fellowship with God is heaven on earth. That's what it is. Regardless of what's going on. Now, my headlights work better at night than they do in the daytime, frankly. They light things up. My car, I flick those lights on and nobody's around. It's high beam time and drive down that road and see stuff. Doesn't matter how dark that field is over there. Doesn't matter how dark that valley is on the other side. Where I am, I've got light. And that's what God has for you. But he says we need to make sure we got the lights on. If we say we got them on and we're driving in the dark, we're lying and we're not doing what's true. Now, as we come to the Lord's table this morning, we have a chance to celebrate heaven on earth. The Lord God himself, present through Jesus, right here in our world. But this comes with a challenge. Do you have your lights on? Is there something that's dimming those lights? This time of year, we've got to start thinking about that, don't we? Do you ever notice how salt and snow and slush can make your lights not so great? Oh, they're burning away, but I've, you know, I get in my car and look, and it's like, whoa, am I eyes failing, or what happened? And then I get out, and I look, and yikes, these lights are covered with all sorts of grime. And so we clean them off, and it's like, whoa, brand new car. Same thing happens with us, isn't it? If there's unforgiveness, if there's sin, if there's resentment, if there's some area where we're just saying, I don't want to deal with God in this part of my life, I still want to do my own thing, that will put us in that darkened place. 
And Paul, when he gave us the words for the Lord's table, he, he challenged us. He said, make sure you examine yourself. Get out and examine your headlights. If there's something blocking the light of, of Jesus in your life, take care of it before you celebrate heaven on earth by taking the bread and the cup. So what I'm going to ask you to do as we partake of the Lord's table this morning and we finish our service is while you're waiting and the, the team is singing, just ask the Lord. Are my headlights bright? And if not, just ask for his forgiveness and just say, Lord, help me clean these things up. I want to, I want to see things your way. Let's allow the word who is the light to bring heaven to earth.